Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, I am honored to speak to one of the members of our PDR posse, Paul Fleming. Paul has a story to tell. Paul has a history to tell about health care and much more. Paul, thank you so kindly for being a part of the PDR posse, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to hear your story. Well, thank you for being the kind person that you are, uh, you know, with a blessing of a demeanor that carries you through all trials and tribulations. I just feel like that all of us are put through a test to have a testimony to tell. And I'm proud to be able to still tell my story because some people with my disease are gone and don't have a story to tell. It's just people that they've left behind have their story. So, Paul, let, let's let's go from the beginning. You're you're I mean, we've all we've all been a part of the healthcare system. But in your case, something occurred to you that uh, made it much more difficult to navigate. Why don't you tell us the genesis, the beginning of, of, of what you went through? Well, you know, at 37, I was really getting into the prime of my career. Uh, I was a high ranking official with a major restaurant chain. And uh, I could actually see uh, the finish line of the type of future that I wanted. And, uh, you know, traveling in out of town, trying to manage family life, um, you know, it was difficult to put on my wife of just now 33 years. So um, all the kudos go to her. Uh, But, you know, coming home one weekend, trying to help out with the laundry and be the man that, you know, I've chosen to be. I'm doing laundry uh, one Saturday morning, uh, and then it happened. I turned the corner, and my left side just shut off, like someone just turned off a light switch. My breathing pattern changed, and I found myself on the floor looking up at the four-year lights, like, Lord, what is going on? And, uh, And then I started with my toes, trying to get it to move, and I swear to you, it, it seemed like it, it was an hour, but it probably was no more than three to five minutes um, of me regaining the use of my leg, my toes first, then my leg, then my hands, then my arm. And so I slowly stood up and did 10 jumping jacks, sprang up both flights of stairs, looked down and said, Lord, I need to schedule a doctor's appointment. Nothing happened the rest of the day. And I didn't say anything to anybody in, in the house about it. Uh, the very next day, doing the exact same thing, it happened again. But this time when I looked up, my youngest son was looking down at me. And I guess he could see the distress on my face because he started screaming for his mother when he saw me struggling to try to get up off the floor. And when he started screaming, that just put me in a panic to hurry up and get off the floor. And by the time my wife made it out of the bedroom, I was halfway up the stairs. I tried to deny what was happening but my youngest son wouldn't let me off the hook. So I had to admit that something was wrong with dad, but I will be going to the hospital to find out what's going on. So being the person that he is, he had to examine his father for 30 minutes and I let him in the bedroom <laughs> to see me. <laughs> and, and then as a child would do, he slowly just left the room, you know. Uh, and it took me three doctors I had to fire three doctors before getting to the right one. One doctor told me I just needed to lose weight. Well, had he looked at the chart, I had just lost 40 pounds. So I'm like, okay, you're out. Went to a neurologist. He just did it as a, uh, I guess, the first, like you said, a consultation. When you just sit down, he just talk about it. But he didn't talk about ordering any tests or anything. I'm like, did you not hear what I said to you, sir? I lost the total use of my left side. I was literally paralyzed on the floor. Oh yeah, you know, well, you know, we'll we'll schedule another appointment and we'll get into all of that. And when I wanted to get into the specifics of what he was planning on doing, he would just ignore me. And then I went to another doctor that just said he just didn't, you know, he couldn't help me. Something in my heart just told me to ask for the youngest doctor in the practice. This young doctor, not only did he order every test of this under the sun, the most amazing part is that he sent the information out of his practice and, you know, to the Mayo Clinic, to Emory here in Atlanta and to the Shepherd Center here in Atlanta. And the Shepherd Center here in Atlanta uh, asked that he do a spinal tap 
And it was just fortunate enough that the hospital nearby just installed the type of machine that they could just lay me on there and it was laser guided. So I wouldn't feel any pain because everybody gave me a nightmare story about going to the doctor's office. He's got a long needle and it's going to hurt. And I was like, geez, I don't know if I wanted to do that. But, you know, I did it because I needed to. And but it still took me three months to get an appointment with a specialist uh, in the city. So let me, let me stop you right there, because I, I, want, sure. I want folks to see one thing right here. You had good health insurance with your company then, correct? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. As a matter uh, of fact. I shared insurance with my wife's job, too. So I was double covered. We double covered each way, which was really, you know, a neat thing to do. This is important for our audience to realize because you were double covered with private insurance and still yes. to see a specialist, you had to wait three months. We always yes. talk about the difference between our system and the Canadian system or the British system is that your mm -hmm. times you have mm -hmm. to wait and wait and wait. Well, here right. you go with a condition that at one point left you paralyzed on the left side. And here in America, with two very good private health care insurance policies, you still had to wait yep. three months. Had to wait three months without any medication. I, want the, I wanted our audience, uh, Paul, to, to hear that because of the yes. fallacies you get from the right that somehow miraculously our right. private system is great. Right. Please continue, my Just friend. Just to make a normal appointment, you at least have to wait almost a month in some occasions. Right. You know, so it happens in America just like it probably would anywhere else. So the myth, again, that some people in politics want to spread about, you know, other country's healthcare system is just totally false. I mean, you can be braggadocious about something, but make sure that it's factual, you know, because not having the wrong information can have you die. You know, in right. my case, having the wrong information, had I believed the first doctor who said I just needed to lose weight, I could have just totally lost it, the use of my left side and not ever got it back. Because and in you could between have been driving, you could have been right. driving, not knowing Absolutely. that her as you Absolutely. were driving. Absolutely. A part yeah. of my job is that I covered the Southeast from North Carolina to Texas. Um, and so each city that I get come into, I have to drive to the destinations. So it could have happened, you know, it could have happened that way. And and thank goodness that it didn't. Um, you know, and I just went into a panic. Well, I'll let you carry on with it because I know we can't be all day with this interview. Oh, no, no, but, but what, what, what I want to do is get now. So we got to the position where uh, you finally got your spinal tap, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. now they're they, they're going to discover what's wrong with you. Right. So I had the spinal tap and he since the Emory, I mean, since the Shepherd Center responded first, he sent the information back and the proteins in my spine indicated that I had multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it took three months to get to my specialist. But in between time, I started having seizures. I didn't know what was going on again. So I scheduled another doctor's appointment. But just luckily, the very next week, I had an appointment. And me being, you know, a man, I guess, being real ignorant, I didn't go to the emergency room. I just said, oh, I got a doctor's appointment. I'm going to be OK. You know, when you, when you feel young and healthy, you know, you just it gives right. you the wrong thoughts about things that you just don't know about. And right. fortunately enough for me, I made it to that next appointment and he had to just literally sit me in the hallway while he see other patients until it happened again. And when it happened, he came up and he immediately knew what it was. And so since like the first month, since I took the first when I took the first dosage of that medication, I never had another seizure. OK, so, so it's the quick, so I, it's the quick reaction by him, and the quickness of the appointment. I think that really prevented other things from happening to me. Now, uh, so how has it been now that you've discovered you've had multiple sclerosis at 37? Um, can I ask you how old you are now or? I'm 56. I'll be 57 this year. So that's almost 20 years ago that you found out you had multiple sclerosis. Yes, 2004. How, how, 2004. How has mm -hmm. the pathway with the healthcare system and uh, medicine, the, the pharmaceutical system, been for you? Okay, in the in the very beginning, because um, because I had, uh, 
because I had double coverage through my wife and myself. Uh, but it, but I was really afraid to continue with my job, you know, being on airplanes and driving vehicles. So I resigned. Um, and so I lost part of that coverage. And then something happened on my wife's job. And so we had no coverage from one time, but then I got another job, you know, in town because I needed to work and I wanted to work. Uh, and I got, I found another job in like two weeks. So it was no big deal. And I had coverage again. And then that's when the owl browsing raising effect took place. Coming into the very next year, the cost of my medication, the first 30 day supply of my medication cost $15,000. And because I made so much money so fast as a young man, and I think my doctor, and not, I, I really believe my doctor told me about other um, philanthropists out there, I can't say that word correctly, but that, that provide help for people uh, with medical problems and those other organizations out there. I sort of glossed over it because I had the money. It's like, ah, eh, you know, because I really didn't know. Because I was covered already, I ain't going to cost me that much, you know. But when it became $15,000, I'm like, whoa. But I had the money, so I just paid it. And I, and I just paid, paid it. And then after the first one, you paid that one month for that one month. January of each year was $15,000, almost $16,000. And I dropped and you paid it. it out of pocket. I paid it out of pocket. And, and then you um, didn't reimburse. No, of course not. No, that's just, that's just money gone. And then after that, though, then it gradually, because you're on a scale to, to pay out your deduction. But the first payment did that. But the payment still was $600 a month after, thereafter for a 30 day supply. Each month, $600. Eventually, it slid all the way down to like $250, $300 by December. But the very next January, you're back at $15,000 again. It started that process all over again. So I guess the first four or five years, <laughs> I did that. And it drained you. My wife, my wife being a realtor, uh, which in all of her jobs, bless her, she just had it as a hobby and I didn't care. Everything she wanted me, to, wanted to do, I just, okay, I encouraged it. You know, she has a, uh, she's a real estate broker. She sells life and health insurance. Uh, she did reverse mortgages. Uh, anything she thought she wanted to do. So she owns about four or five Georgia state licenses. And she's like, honey, we're gonna have to sell our home. And I, as if I wasn't depressed enough, uh, that we had to move out of our home into an apartment, which my kid never experienced. You know, a parent always think the worst because, you know, you always want the next generation to have more than what you had. Mm -hmm. And so we looked around at several apartments. My kids were so excited. It was the total opposite of how we were feeling in apartments for about four years until they kept raising uh, the amount to live in there. When it got just over a thousand dollars. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa! We can be back in a home again. And so, my wife, being the magician that she is, we found our way back. Uh, but then, eventually, I had to leave that job because I had a relapse. And my supervisor, you know, all my employees, I told you know what my challenges were. But when my supervisor came in, she was being so rude that you know she almost fired all the my the, my coworkers. I call them coworkers, even though I was the boss. Because I never had to boss anymore. I trained you properly on the way you go. And as you continue to train and explain, and then they would just did the job. So I just would never allow them to tell friends or family that I'm the boss. This is my coworker. I say in your private time, you can say that, but I'm not your boss. People that I have to manage, yes, I'm your boss. But the people that come in and do the job, we're just coworkers. That's how I view the workplace. And that's why. Even today, if I go around town and just happen to run into a person, they want to know where I'm working at because they would leave their job to come work for me because I will let you be who you are, you know, knowing the goals we have to accomplish. Once we accomplish, relax, go take a smoke break. I don't care, you know, but when it's time to go to work, we all come together as a group and make things happen. Yeah, man. Now, so you, you went ahead with all, uh, you, you got to move back into your home, but you had to sell your house because of medical conditions and you've given the, the big pharma 
pretty much six to seven thousand dollars or more than that. Easily, over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars worth. He's, yeah, one yeah more like that. That. But still, but still, after getting this medication, they weren't guaranteeing you anything. You still had a relapse after being on this yeah. medication. I still had a relapse over the now 20 years because you say, I'm like, wow, it really is that long. Uh, I've probably been on eight different medications. At one time, I was taking 18 pills a day. Wow. Wow. And and to the point to where it was it was causing me heart issues like it would get extremely hot. I would get extremely hot and my breathing pattern would change. And I could feel my heartbeat slowing down so much. So and it would usually happen. I'm by myself in the house, but I don't know what came over me to take all my clothes off. And I hate to say that, in the interview, but I had to take my clothes off. And within like one minute, it was like nothing ever happened. And right. up until um, it happened at a MS event, because I would take different family members around. So they would understand what happening to me around town. I would take them to an MS event. And it just so happened my oldest brother and my mother was with me when it happened again. And the man speaking was one of my doctor's uh, interns. And it happened there. And I, I thought I really thought I was just leaving right there. And I apologized to my mom and my brother, everybody in the room. I could hear them crying as I'm slowly fading away. And with my last breath, I, t I told the doctor to take my shirt off. And he was like, your shirt? And my last nod, well, that's all I had left. Because I could hear him saying 62 beats a minute, 43 beats a minute, all the way down to like 15, yeah, 15 beats a minute, you know, because he had already yelled out to call an ambulance. Right. And, um, and sure enough, took my shirt off and I snapped back to it. And I'm looking around, everybody's crying, I'm like, what's wrong? And in my mind, that's when my mom really started bawling. And but the doctor, the, the ambulance people came in and checked me out, like, oh, he's fine. He goes, Do well, do you want to go with him? No, nah, I'll be okay. I'll just they let me do an emergency appointment with them since one of the doctors that I go to saw it. And so then they just start running other tests on me. Uh, to help me find out. And then I went to the top cardiologist in the state. Nobody could figure it out. And then, so I just re-examined it. I re-examined all the medication I was taking and it was some conflicts. So I just gradually on my own, slowly took myself off of medications. To this day, now I only take my MS medication, uh, my neurological pills, cause I have some, every now and then some reactions, some gabapentin. And that's right. it in my vitamins. That's it. And now, I've never had a as, problem again. Now, so uh, as far as how you're dealing now with the medical system, uh, before before the Affordable Care Act, did, were you able to get insurance or was that uh, that pre-existing condition an issue? Well, I always knew that I could retire with this disease. And so with that last job, um, I just I just applied and was approved the very first time and people still struggle today having MS of being not approved. And I don't understand why. Or for um, um, social security, security disability. Social security. Yeah, I'm on SSI. And, um, but still even being on SSI, I had to reach out to these uh, organizations that would help pay my medical costs because I would have to literally sell my house. I probably, we probably, well, my wife really does have a really good job now and she's still doing real estate. So we probably would be okay, but it would be really difficult on her. Something that I wouldn't want her to go through because I told her and, you know, I told her if it gets really, really bad, I would leave you because I wouldn't want you to go through suffering to have two, three, four jobs, which she already does basically part-time on her own anyway. Um, but I wouldn't want her to have to worry about me in that way. You know, I just love her too much. And I guess she loves me too much too. Some of you fool, you should shut up. Don't say that to me. He's like, don't say that to me. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it takes for you. Is what she told me. Paul, I tell you something. And that, that is what we fight about, right? Hell, yeah. that you had a bad hand we all get a hand in what life has to offer us right and that you got yep. a bad hand and that your personal economy should reflect your bad hand that you had no no way of choosing 
uh, that is what health care for all, ensuring that we are all our brothers keepers, ensuring that society is there to support us all. That's what right. it takes. Right. I've sent you being able to get from uh, support from uh, other sources. Nobody should have to be hunting for support to stay alive. If you come, if you work in a in a big corporation that is on the stock market, like a food chain that I was involved in, um, then you're you're paying into the system. And I try to explain to people like this that, that talk about health care. I said, in business, especially a restaurant chain, you always have one or more stores that suffers to make a profit, but you always have a few money makers to cover their losses. And so this is how you keep that other store afloat until you can either do the proper marketing or hire the right people to increase sales. And sometimes the restaurant is just in the wrong place. And, you know, fortunately enough for me, I had the type of restaurant education to understand that, you know, because I basically started from the ground up in the business. And even after I left being sick, I was still offered to be co-owners of the business, but I was just too afraid of a relapse. And I didn't want to, if I couldn't feel like I contribute a hundred percent, I just didn't want to do it. You know, but I still could have been a, a very wealthy person even after I got sick. But I didn't want to lie to anyone like everything is OK when I really felt like deep in my heart that it wouldn't. So, you know, and I'm that's just fortunate that the medication works. And that is honesty. And you know what? We need a hell of a lot more of that, Paul. So, Paul, um, we're coming close to the end. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about is to let people understand, I mean, the amount of tribulations one can go through, you are able to navigate uh, between your private insurance company and getting uh, those those companies that give offers. But uh, when when some people hear that you had to pay fifteen thousand uh, dollars for your uh, once a year for your drugs, as and then after six hundred dollars a month, that should mm -hmm. give everybody mm -hmm. pause for something that they should know they can have in a good healthcare system, it would be provided in a good healthcare system. The stresses yep. that you have to go through for healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, many people, uh, there's no reason for us to live this way. But you know, I, I hope Absolutely. your story, along with the stories of others, uh, continue to make a difference because that is how we're gonna change people's minds. Paul Fleming, thank you so kindly <laughs> having been a politics done right. Thank you for having me, brother. I really appreciate you. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.